Good evening, brethren and guests, and welcome to Burlingame Lodge number 400's monthly Masonic guest speaker presentation. This is the seventh speaker in our speaker series. My name is Barry R. Kopp, as you just heard, junior warden of this lodge. On behalf of our lodge, we would like to offer a sincere fraternal welcome to all. We are very pleased to have you here with us again this evening. Before we begin, Brother Aidan Cotter, our chaplain, will lead us in a prayer. Brother Chaplain. Brothers, I would ask that you would assume an attitude of prayer. Great architect of the universe, in thy name we have assembled, and in thy name we desire to proceed in all our doings. Grant that the sublime principles of Freemasonry may so subdue every discordant passion within us, so harmonize and enrich with thine own love and goodness, that the Lodge at this time may humbly reflect that order and beauty which reign forever before thy throne. Amen. So mote it be. And brethren, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. Marty, please display the flag. Brother Chris, please lead us in the pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Brother Chris. Helping us tonight, we have Worshipful Brother Roberto Diaz, Jr., Master, Worshipful Brother Marty Cousing, whom you have met, past Master, Worshipful Brother Gary Stevens, also a past Master of Burlingame 400, and Brothers Chris Advincula, Jr., and Brother Aidan Cotter as chaplain. So with that, brethren, it is my great pleasure an honor to introduce to our lecture series, Worshipful Brother Tim Hogan, past master, speaking to us from the mile high city of Aurora, Colorado. Now, now I know it's Denver, but I think Aurora is pretty much probably at this pretty close to the same altitude as that. Yeah, same, we, we border each other for sure. <laughs> yeah, pretty tight. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Brother Tim, is a past master, as mentioned, of several different esoteric organizations over the past 20 years, as well as a leader in several Masonic bodies. An author, a well-known lecturer, and former editor and writer for La Initiation, Ariadne's Web, and Livingstone's Magazine. Worshipful Brother Tim will be presenting this evening a discussion about the Holy Grail and Freemasonry. Worshipful Brother Tim, with that, the virtual floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Worshipful. Um, well, brethren, I, I'm so happy to be presenting before you today. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, something that is uh, maybe at first blush, you don't think of Freemasonry uh, and the Holy Grail, though um, Dan Brown certainly popularized this idea to a certain degree. Uh, but I'm going to get into a little bit more meat than what uh, Dan Brown you know, flirted with, I guess, in, in his books. So um, with that, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And uh, so you can see some slides that I've prepared as I as I present here. So let me uh, bring this up here. All right, here we go. So everyone see that? We're good. All right, so this says uh, Templar and Holy Grail history, but really what we're going to be talking about here is, is the Holy Grail myths, where they um, were popularized, and, uh, and how this has anything to do with Freemasonry. 
within Freemasonry itself, I mean, Freemasonry is not um, foreign to the idea of a quest. Uh, certainly within the Masonic tradition, we've we've heard the idea of, uh, you know, the quest for the lost word of Freemasonry um, in uh, some of the uh, um, other degrees of Freemasonry within some of the appendant bodies of Freemasonry, like the like the Scottish Rite, for example, uh, and others, there there are certainly degrees that uh, illustrate some sort of a some sort of a, a quest or a, or a period of wandering, uh, looking for something, and uh, these are ideas that we find uh, within the Grail myths. Um, just to give you like a kind of a really brief uh, summary of the, the Holy Grail story. Um, the, 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 the legends of the Holy Grail uh, first appeared, as far as we can tell, uh, as early as the 1100s. And it was during this time that wandering troubadours in the area of southern France uh, began to first tell the story. Uh, they, they came to be associated with the Arthurian legends uh, within uh, the British Isles. Um, but the first, uh, the first person to really uh, tell the story of uh, the Holy Grail was, was a guy by the name of Chrétien de Troyes, who was out of France. And he, was, uh, he told one of the first stories of the Holy Grail. And then shortly thereafter, there was another guy by the name of Wolfram von Eschenbach, uh, who was a German knight. Uh, but he also told the story of the Holy Grail in a book called Parsifal. And both of these stories tell, you know, a similar thing. Basically, the story goes that there was a uh, there was a Grail King. There was this king that that guarded the Holy Grail, and he had a whole team of people under him who who guarded the Holy Grail. And uh, he went out into battle, and he. Uh, his battle charge was, uh, he, he gave a battle charge in the name of love, but it wasn't like pure love from the heart. It was more like, um, more like lust as opposed to love. And as a result, uh, he, he got in this fight. He, he ended up uh, losing the fight. He got a terrible wound in his thigh and uh, it rendered him miserable i mean he couldn't the, the grail legends say he couldn't he couldn't sit but he couldn't stand he wasn't alive but he wasn't dead he was just torn between these dualities and his name was the fisher king was 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 he was referred to as and when he got really sick from this wound the land itself became really sick as well and things stopped growing the um there was uh, uh, fighting amongst the different uh, territories within the uh, within the different kingdoms. They all started fighting. There was a great plague that set over across the land uh, where everyone was getting sick. And so there was this ecological disaster combined with a with a plague, a health disaster combined with fighting. And it was just it was a miserable time. And it was right around this time that uh, King Arthur said, well, we, we, can't, we can't have this. I can't rule a kingdom that's falling apart. Um, and, uh, and this miracle appeared at Arthur's court where uh, uh, all of a sudden the, the Holy Grail appeared. And then it disappeared just as quickly as it had appeared. And uh, everyone was like, what, what was that? And uh, Merlin, who was the, the great sage in Arthur's court, uh, basically spoke up and said, well, that was the Holy Grail. And that's what you need to find if you're going to restore the wasteland. So all the knights of the round table, they all swore to do this quest to find the Holy Grail. 
because uh, it was believed if they found this grail, then it would restore the ecological disaster. It would restore the, it would get rid of the plague. Uh, people would stop fighting and it would heal the Fisher King who had received this wound. Uh, so this was the, this was the, what the quest was all about. This is what the quest for the Holy Grail was all about. And so all the knights went out and searched for the Grail. Ultimately, there were three different Grail champions, three different knights who found the Grail. Uh, but there was only one of them who was able to heal the Fisher King. And this was the, uh, in some stories, it was a knight by the name of Galahad. In others, it was a knight by the name of Parsifal. And they found the grail and they, they healed the Fisher King with it. And as a result, um, everything restored back to balance and uh, things were good again. So this was the, this was the general story. But uh, let's, let's take a look at this, um, some more passages from this uh, particular uh book this is uh so this is a this is a passage that i have up here on the screen this is from wolfram von eschenbach's parsival where he's describing the holy grail and in it he says the grail is well known to me many formidable fighting men dwell at mount salvage with the grail by the way mount salvage just means the mountain of salvation they are continually riding out on sorties in quest of adventure. Whether these same Templars reap trouble or renown, they bear it for their sins. So right away, we're learning that the guardians of the Holy Grail, according to Wolfram von Eschenbach's book from the 1200s, was the Templars. So uh, that's in his book. Then he says, a warlock company lives there, and I will tell you how they are nourished. They live from a stone whose essence is most pure. If you've never heard of it, I shall name it for you here. It is called Lapsit Exilis. By virtue of this stone, the phoenix is burned to ashes in which he is reborn. Thus does the phoenix molt its feathers, which done, it shines dazzling, dazzling bright and lovely as before. Further, however ill a mortal may be, from the day on which he sees the stone, he cannot die for that week, nor does he lose his color. For if anyone, maid or man, were to look at the grail for 200 years, you would have to admit that his color was as fresh as in his early prime, except that his hair would gray. <laughs> Such powers does the stone confer on mortal men that their flesh and bones are made young again. This stone is also called the grail so right away so here's this um you know this out this text one of the earliest texts on the holy grail from the 1200s uh in the book parsival by wolfram von eschenbach and in it he says the guardians of the grail are the templars and he says that the grail has some sort of association with what we would now refer to as um alchemy uh, and uh, the metaphors of the phoenix uh, dying and coming back and the, the describing the grail as a stone that's able to heal and uh, keep people fresh and young uh, and that the, the grail is the stone. I mean, it, it's alluding to some sort of alchemical mystery. So this is, again, from the 1200s and alchemy by the way it you know was just the process of taking something of lesser value and uh well and then applying this out this grail the stone to it and it would transmute the thing of lesser value into something of greater value so um you know like the the metaphor usually is turning base metals like lead into gold uh, but it can also be um, making medicines that that restore youth and uh, raises consciousness. So here's the uh, so here's the description of the Holy Grail. This is from the 1200s. Now we know who the Templars were. I mean, uh, uh, many 
people, especially Freemasons, are, um, you know, have some exposure to the Templars, either through uh, their research into the, the history of Freemasonry or even within the degrees themselves. I mean, the Templars show up in all of the... Um, the main appendant bodies of Freemasonry, whether you're looking at the York Rite with the uh, where there's an order of the temple uh, uh, in the, the higher levels of the York Rite or within the Scottish Rite, there's a there's a Knight Kadosh degree, which just means Holy Knight, which was a Knight Templar. Or uh, if you look at other rites in Freemasonry on the other side of the Atlantic, like uh, the Swedish Rite of Freemasonry. Um, in the Swedish Rite of Freemasonry, it's a it's a completely Templar-based uh, form of Freemasonry. In fact, the, your Master Mason degree, the Templar flag, is draped over the altar uh, for your Master Mason degree. So, uh, it's this is something that you find uh, within Freemasonry. Um, it's not emphasized as much in the Blue Lodge, um, but uh, there's history to it. So who, who are these Templars and what were they about? Um, one of the first things we need to look at with them and that I want to point out is the Templars had what was known as a rule, which was in Freemasonry, we would call it a book of constitutions. But back in the 1200s, uh, the late 1100s and the early 1200s, when the Templars were really active, uh, the ancient Templars were really active, there was, uh, they had what was known as a rule. And in the rule was basically the guidelines for how Templars should operate. And so this is a one of the Templar rules, and this is from 1240, and we see some articles in it. And Article 8 says, there are elected brothers and consoled brothers throughout the world. Where you see tall buildings built, make the signs of recognition, and you will find many righteous men with knowledge of God and the great art. They have received it from their fathers and masters and are all brothers. Among them are the good men of Toulouse, the poor of Leon, the Albigensian, those near Verona, Bergamo, the Baholi of Galencia and Tuscany, the Bugards and Bulgarians. You will lead them to your chapters by underground passages. And for those who are fearful, you'll give them the consolamentum outside the chapter before three witnesses. And then in Article 9, it says, you will receive fraternally the brothers of these groups, and in the same way, the consoled of Spain and Cyprus will fraternally receive the Saracens, the Druze, and those who live in Lebanon. So here are, so here's a Templar rule, and it's saying, look, the Templars have special associations and special recognitions with several groups. Uh, and it points out who all these different groups are. And it says, if you have to look for tall buildings, first of all, so it's saying that the people who the Templars have special relations with obviously know how to build big buildings. That's number one. Number two, it says you need to make signs of recognition. So it's saying that the Templars had special signs of recognition that they were making with these other groups and that these other groups were all passing on these traditions. So who are these other groups? Well, it just so happens that all of the people that are, all of these groups that are mentioned in these articles uh, belong to a, uh, a group. They were, they were a gr groups of mystics that, uh, referred to themselves as Gnostics. And Gnostics were people who believed that anybody could receive a direct knowledge, a divine experiential knowledge of God uh, without the intervention of a priest. So they believe that anybody could have a direct connection with God through their own efforts. And this is part of what separated them from the Roman church at the time, 
or the, even the Eastern Church at the time, which taught that uh, you can only get to God through an e intermediary, which was a priest. Uh, well, all of these groups didn't believe that you needed a priest to come to connect with God. And the Templars had special associations with them. So let's look at some of these a little bit more. Here's the, uh, this is the, um, this is just a few things. Uh, this is the, this is on the left here. This is Jacques de Molay. He was largely regarded, regarded as one of the, the last grand master of the Knights Templar while they were still under the Roman Catholic um, patronage. Um, in 1314, they were, uh, the Templars were suppressed by the Roman church. They were declared no longer um, under the uh, patronage of the Roman church. And many believe they went underground at that time. And they went and they hid amongst these other groups that they had special associations with. Uh, we also see up here on, on the upper right, that's the one of the seals of the Knights Templar, which was two knights riding one horse. And then down here, this was the Templar flag, also known as the Bosiant, which was uh, black and white, you know, checkered with the, the red Templar cross in it. Let's look at a few other examples of things that the Templars were known for in their day. Uh, particularly related to uh, these alchemical sciences, because the Templars, along with meeting with these Gnostic groups, uh, it also mentioned that they had special associations with groups like the Druze that lived in Lebanon. And the Druze, amongst other things, were known for translating and making available uh, ancient Egyptian, Coptic, Roman, and Greek alchemical manuscripts. So they were translating these alchemical manuscripts and trying to make, um, you know, learning how to make certain elixirs that could heal the body and uh, could make things, uh, you know, to you know, could heal things. So the Templars learned about this and, uh, and then uh, started applying it themselves. And the, and the Templars were known for, amongst other things, when it came to health, they were known for developing and creating uh, CPR. They were also, because they believed that the breath uh, contained a vital life force that if you could stimulate uh, a dead body breathing, that it will bring it back from the dead. They also were experimenting around with uh, certain mold extracts, which we now recognize um, were being used uh, in what we would call antibiotics now. I mean, they were, they were developing things like penicillin. But this was clear back in the, the 1200s. So and we have this example in, in, uh, Recorded in 1245, William de Sonnach became the Sandvin Grand Master of the Templar Order in Jerusalem. And later in 1247, Brother William de Sonnach sent a distinguished Knight Templar delegation to England in order to present to King Henry III a portion of the blood of our Lord, which he shed to the cross with the salvation of the planet enclosed in the handsome crystalline vessel. The relic was authenticated beneath the seal from the patriarch of Jerusalem, the bishops, abbots, and nobles on the Holy Land. The sacred vessel was called the Chalice of the Rose Cross, and it contained the rare hermetic and alchemical elixir, which was called the Blood of Christ or the Red Lion. This vessel passed into the possession of Henry IV, King of Navarre, and the vessel and its contents were later deposited in the Cathedral Church of St. Paul. So here's an example of where they were taking this knowledge. They put it in some sort of a special vessel, which they called the Chalice of the Rose Cross. 
And of course, this sounds very similar to something that we would normally associate with the Holy Grail around the same time period. Um, here we see, uh, this is uh, on the left here, this is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He wrote the Rule of the Templar. He's the one who wrote the first um, Book of Constitutions for the Templar Order. He also founded the Cistercian Order. Many people believe the Templar Order was originally established as kind of like a, a fighting force for the uh, Cistercians. And uh, they were going to the Holy Land and finding texts and uh, other things and bringing them back to Europe for the Cistercians to translate and to then make available. In the middle here, this is Hugh de Paines. He was, he was actually the first Grand Master of the Knights Templar. He was also married to Catherine de St. Clair of Scotland. And Catherine de St. Clair was the cousin of Chrétien de Troyes, uh, Chrétien de Troyes, who was the, who wrote the very first Grail legend. So the very person who wrote the very first Grail legend was actually the cousin of the wife of Hugh de Paints, who was the first Grand Master of the Knights Templar. So there was some connection there. Uh, here on the right, this is a depiction of a uh, a uh, 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 man by the name of Michael Silos, and then the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church by the name of Theoclete. And they were said to have initiated Hugh de Paines and Godfrey de St. Omar and to have given them the mission to start the Templar order itself. So this has been back in uh, about 1118. Is what standard historians say. Some of the other people that were kind of at the founding of the Templar Order. By the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna tie this all into Freemasonry here soon. <laughs> so I'm giving you a little backstory of the Templars and the Grail, but I'm gonna tie it into the to Freemasonry here in a minute. So um, some of the other characters that were important in the founding of the Templar Order included uh, Shlomo Yitzaki, who is also known as Rashi of Troy, of Troyes. Uh, he was a friend of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He had also initiated uh, Godfrey de Bouillon, who was the first king of Jerusalem. And he was a famous Kabbalist in Troyes, in, in France. And, and Kabbalah was the um, the mystical Judaism, um, it was, it was the, the Gnostic mystical branch of Judaism was Kabbalah. So uh, Shlomo Yatzaki, also known as Rashi of Troya, of Twa, he was the, um, he was this very famous Kabbalist, and he was one of the people who had an influence on the, the creation of the Templar order. I already talked about St. Bernard of Clairvaux and Catherine de St. Clair. Uh, I will say with Shlomo Yatzaki or Rashi, uh, at the Council of Troyes in 1128 is when the first rule was created. And that first rule was created with 72 articles. And it was said that those 72 articles corresponded to what were known as the 72 Kabbalistic names of God within Jew Jewish mysticism. So, and it's believed that Rashi of, of Twa was the one who, you know, uh, encouraged St. Bernard of Clairvaux to, to implement that. Uh, finally, Hugh de Paines himself, his grandfather was Theobald de Paines de Ma de Gadil, and he was actually a Moorish Sufi. And um, Sufism was the mystic branch of Islam. So Hugh de Payne's grandfather was actually Muslim, but he was a mystic Muslim. Uh, he was married to Catherine de St. Clair, who was the um, cousin of Chrétien de Troyes, who made the first Grail legend wrote the first Grail legends. 
The rule is being given by um, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who is also a uh, widely believed to have been practicing a practicing druid within the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And then, so you had, um, and then the families of, of the original knights who all joined the Templar order, they all belonged to the um, Albigensian Cathar families, which were these Gnostic Christians that lived in Southern France. So right at the beginning of the Templar order, you had Druid influence, you had Gnostic influence, you had Sufi influence, and you had um, Kabbalistic influence, and of course, alchemical influence as well. So there were these mystical ideas that were right at the foundation of the Templar order. Now, one of the things that's really fascinating about the Templar order, and this is where we're going to start to get into some Masonic potential connections here. Um, and this is, by the way, this is beyond, there are other authors who have uh, hypothesized a connection between Freemasonry and the Knights Templar. But um, the first person to really write a lengthy book on the, uh, the subject was John J. Robinson's book, uh, Born in Blood, in which he, you know, he pr provides a number of circumstantial evidence things that seems to point to the idea that Freemasonry came out of the Knights Templar. And he did this as a Templar historian. I mean, that was his background. He was a Templar historian. He was not a Freemason when he wrote that book, but he became a Freemason later on. I'm going to point out some other things that uh, make that case even stronger and then tie it in with the Grail legends again. So one of the places that uh, was fundamental to the early formation of the Templar order was uh, a place in Constantinople that was known as the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus. And this church later became the commandery for the Templar order in Constantinople. But this is where uh, Godfrey de St. Omar and Hugh de Paines were both first initiated and made, uh, they were knighted and given the mandate to start the Templar order. It was in this, uh, this special church in Constantinople. In more recent years, it has since been turned into a mosque. Um, and this is a, you know, this is kind of a, here on the left, this is a picture of it, uh, of what it looks like now. Um, pretty looks like a pretty typical mosque it's it's you know it's blue and it's uh it's nice i will point out uh, at the front of the mosque there's a couple of pillars with globes on them which is very unusual you don't normally find that in moss and you'll also see a, a honeycomb turret uh, up at the top and we'll discuss that more in a little bit i have um, visited this mosque several times, uh, and there's several key things in it that, that go back to the Templars, one of which is underneath the floor of the mosque here, there's a secret crypt, and in this secret crypt, there are tombs, and, and these are pictures, you know, some photos of, of the, you know, the graves in, in these tombs, in this tomb that's in this crypt. Uh, it's a Templar crypt that dates back to the 1200s. And one of the things that's really fantastic about it is that there are Jewish Christian and Muslim Templars who are all buried together in this crypt at this place that was the former uh, commander, grand commandery for the Templar order in Constantinople. And, 
you know, you may be thinking, well, so what, you know, I mean, okay. So that there were, there were Templars that were of different faiths and they're all buried together, but, um, even today, if you go to most cemeteries around the world, you'll find that the Christians are buried in one area, the Jews are buried in another area, the Muslims are buried in another area. And it is, it is very, very rare to see people of different faiths all buried together. In fact, the only time you usually see that is uh, either uh, in a military wing of the of the cemetery or a Masonic wing of a cemetery. Um, but here we have, going back to the 1200s, all Templars being buried together, Templars of different faiths being buried together in this crypt at this uh, commandery. Also on the there are pillars on the upper level of this mosque or of this building, which used to be a church. And on one of the, the pillars, we find this, which is a square encompasses next to an Egyptian onk. And this is the earliest depiction of the square encompasses I've been able to find in Europe. This dates back to the 1200s. Uh, and it's being depicted next to, again, an Egyptian Ankh. But this is in the former Templar Grand Commandery building in what's now Istanbul. And this is still in this building. So that's pretty interesting. It suggests, that, I mean, the Templars carved this in their building. And the fact that uh, it's depicting a, you know, a square encompasses next to an Egyptian onk seems to suggest you know, that they were passing on some sort of a tradition there within the, within the Templar order as early as, as the 1200s. One of the things that the Templars, according to, to standard Jewish historians, uh, have one of the things the Templars are credited with finding is they are in the Holy Land. They were, they were, even though their mission was to protect pilgrims in the Holy Land, uh, it's known they were actually digging under the Temple Mount, and they were, they were doing archaeological excavations during this time. And according to standard Jewish historians, there were two prominent Jewish Kabbalistic texts that were found by the Templars uh, back in the 1200s. And they're the Sefer, what's known as the Sefer Habahir and the Zohar. And what's significant about these two texts is they talk about two things. First of all, they, they highlight uh, a code that's found uh, within the Torah or the Old Testament, um, which every letter corresponds to different attributes, including numbers. And so it's believed that the Torah itself was written in this kind of elaborate code. And if you understand the cipher for, for that code, then you can read the Bible in this entirely new way. So that's one of the things that's found in these texts. The other thing that's found is a blueprint, what's believed to be a blueprint for universal creation, uh, which is known as the Kabbalistic tree of life. And that's what this looks like right here. The Templars were said to have found these texts that, that uh, provided this blueprint. And why is this blueprint significant to us as Freemasons? Well, this diagram is set up so that uh, not only is this supposed to be a blueprint for Solomon's temple itself, but it's also a blueprint for the human body and for le levels of consciousness within the human body. So it, it's set up so that there are 10 what are known as uh, sephirot or, or attributes 
of God's consciousness that manifested according to the word of God. So when God spoke the word and, and brought creation into being, as it manifested, it, it manifested with these 10 spheres or these 10 uh, attributes with a, with, a, with a hidden 11th sphere and that they were all connected by 22 paths and each of these 22 paths correspond with one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And it was believed that each of these letters of the Hebrew alphabet represented aspects of God's consciousness manifesting in the world. So as a result, it got arranged so that there were a total of 32 combinations of God's thoughts with a hidden 33rd and that they arranged themselves on three vertical pillars, which were known, went under the, the attributes of wisdom, strength, and beauty. So if you think of your opening of, within your lodges of, uh, for Freemasonry, wisdom to contrive, strength to support, beauty to adorn all our laudable undertakings, that comes directly from this Kabbalistic model with the three pillars, the three vertical pillars that represented wisdom, strength, and beauty. And they were arranged. There were also three levels that you had to go up. So you see these three horizontal levels. And these corresponded to the Hebrew letters Mem, Aleph and Sheen that corresponded to water, air, and fire. So within this diagram, you start out here at the bottom and you kind of work your way up to the top in order to eventually get to Keter, which just represented mastery. So, so in, and in order to get to mastery, you had to cross these three levels that corresponded with water, air and fire and i want you to think about your your degrees i want you to think about the penalties of your obligations for the first degree the second degree and the, then the third degree and you'll realize the first degree penalty is associated with water the second degree penalties associated with air the third degree penalties associated with fire so just as, um, so here's this, this blueprint, this diagram from these Kabbalistic texts that were discovered by the Knights Templar in the 1200s that outline uh, this system of, of um, God's consciousness manifesting on three pillars uh, associated with wisdom, strength, and beauty, and then these three levels that you gotta go, that you got to move up. Um, which is the same blueprint that we find within Freemasonry today. And by the way, there's also 32 combinations with a hidden 33rd combination, which is, you know, pretty interesting coincidence. It's actually not a coincidence because the, when the Grand Lodge of England was established in 1717, the people who set up the Grand Lodge of England all belonged to a group known as the Kabbalah Club that used to meet regularly uh, once, a, once a week. We know who they were. We know what they were studying. We have their minutes. And these were the brothers who ended up forming the Grand Lodge of England. So they were studying Kabbalah. And though that Kabbalah, tra Kabbalistic tradition had been passed down, had been brought to Europe and, and preserved and passed down by the Knights Templar. By the way, so this diagram, if you were to take the middle pillar of it and then just the three horizontal bars, that's where you get this, which is the symbol of the cross of Lorraine. 
which was also one of the main symbols that the early Knights Templar used. And it's still a symbol that you find within Freemasonry today, within the higher degrees of Freemasonry, both in the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Uh, but its origin goes back to this Kabbalistic diagram. Now, in the Kabbalistic uh, tradition, that diagram that I just showed you um, in texts like the Zohar uh, was referred to as the partsuf, which is a Hebrew word that just means face. And when you add the article L on the end of that, which just means God in Hebrew, you get partsufel. And partsufel or Percival is, of course, the name of the hero in the Grail legends. So the very hero of the Grail, the legends of the Holy Grail, Parsifal, gets its name from this Kabbalistic uh, diagram, uh, which is pretty interesting. And by the way, the book Parsifal by Wolfram von Eschenbach which I quoted earlier, it was first published in Toledo in the 1200s. And the publisher that published Parsifal was the same publisher that published the Zohar for the first time, which is this main Kabbalistic text that the Templars are credited with bringing back to Europe. Uh, in the Zohar, we also find, uh, in fact, the very first passage of the Zohar, this Kabbalistic text, it says, and this secret is written about in the verse, I will raise up the cup of salvation, for this is the cup of benediction that is raised after the meal. The cup of benediction must rest on five fingers and no more, just as a lily rests on five rigid leaves that represent the five fingers. And this lily is the cup of benediction. So... Right at the very beginning of the Zohar, it's talking about this secret cup of benediction. And uh, of course, that's what is normally we normally associate with the Holy Grail itself. There are other things, though, in the Zohar that was of use to the Templars when they when they discovered it. Um, one of the things is that the Zohar, uh, even though it was published in the 1200s, it describes the, uh, it's, it says that the earth is round. Uh, it also says that the earth goes around the sun. Uh, in one of the sections, it's, it says that the earth rolls as a ball. So while some are on top, others are down. And while for some people, the sun shines, for others, it is dark. And there is a place where there is daylight all the time, except for a little time of darkness. So again, here's a, here's a text that seems to already know about the earth itself and how it, how it works, how it rolls around the, the solar system. Uh, the Zosar also says that there are seven continents and one of them is not populated, uh, which has led many to believe that this text um, was a was preserving scientific information that had been cal cal cataloged by earlier civilizations and had been preserved into this this text. Uh, and the early Templar navigators used this after the Zohar was discovered, and there were very, many famous. Um, explorers who actually consulted with um, students of this particular text. I'm, I mean, even Christopher Columbus consulted with Rabbi Abraham Zakudo, who is a, uh, would study the Zohar. And Columbus's father-in-law was also a Knight Templar, which is where he learned of this Zohar connection. Um, Rabbi Abraham Zacuto was also the one who advised King Manuel I of Portugal to send Vasco da Gama on his historic journey around Africa. And he guided Vasco da Gama and prepared him for his famous journey. And Vasco da Gama was also a Templar initiate. So when the Templars were suppressed in 1314, they went underground. 
or they moved and one of the places they they went to is portugal and they just reestablished themselves as the knights of christ at that time and in fact many people believe that the word portugal itself originally came from port du graal or port of the grail uh, because portugal is where the templars were uh sailing out of um primarily uh, as they were doing their their trips one of the other things that's in wolfram von eschenbach's parsival is there's kind of a merlin character in it and uh He's, a, he's an advisor to Percival, and, and his name is Trevisrent, the hermit. And it's interesting that the word Trevisrent in German, Old German, just means the threefold knower is what it means. Uh, and this title is equivalent to the Latin Trismegistus, which means thrice great or thrice, thrice illustrious. Uh, so thrice great or threefold knower. And the word hermit comes from the word, the Greek word, Hermes. Therefore, this very character that's in the Grail story Parsifal is, in fact, uh, the legendary Hermes Trismegistus, who was, uh, many believed, was the, um, he, he was considered the patron saint of alchemy. He was the one who knew about alchemy. And uh, it should be pointed out as well that the word, if you take the Greek word Hermes, which is Herm, Hermy, it's spelled like H-E-R-M-E, Hermy, and you transliterate Hermy into Hebrew, and he Hebrew doesn't have vowels. So in, in Hebrew, Hermy in Hebrew would be H-R-M. But H-R-M in Hebrew is also pronounced Hiram. So Hiram is Hermes. And the, um, you know, and Hermes was most known for his statement of as above, so below, or the idea that there was a relationship between the heavens above and the earth below. Of course, we find this idea emphasized on the globes within Freemasonry on top of the pillars. Um, where there are two globes, a, a celestial and a terrestrial, and they're both equal. So it's this, this emphasizing of as above, so below. And the same idea of as above, so below is also emphasized in that book, the Zohar, where it says everything is connected with everything right through to the nethermost end of all the links of the chain. And the true essence of God is both above and below in the heavens and on earth, and nothing exists apart from it. So this was, these were all ideas that, that the early Templars were flirting with and which later found their way into Freemasonry. By the way, this is uh, what's known as the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, which was the, one of the writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus. This is Sir Isaac Newton's translation of it. Uh, but it basically says um, that which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below to do the miracles of the one thing. It says all things have been and arose from the one mind by the meditation of the one. Uh, so this is like a this is like a blueprint or a recipe for how to create the philosopher's stone, which was said to be the stone that could heal the body and transmute base metals into gold. You know, the very, very thing that uh, the Templars were said to be flirting with. So, um, so all, all these ideas found their way into the Grail legends, and then they also found their way later. And one of the things, the other things that we know about the Templars is, as I mentioned before, they the early Templars 
the, the people who formed the original Templar order all came from Albigensian families in southern France. The Albigensians were Gnostics. They believed they were Gnostic Christians. They believed that you didn't need the intervention of a priest to connect with God. Uh, they they also referred to themselves as the sons of light. That's what they referred to themselves as. And they had a series of degrees or initiations that they would, or baptismal rites that they would put their, um, they put people through to prepare them for awakening to this uh, illumination or this gnosis, this direct knowledge of God. But they had to, the people had to be prepared. And they adopted one of the symbols that the Gnostics, like the Abigensians, adopted was the symbol of what was known as Abraxas. And Abraxas was a roosted, rooster headed figure uh, that was holding a, a whip. And, uh, and a shield and had was wearing an apron around his waist. And then he had serpent legs. And then there were seven stars that went up it and the letters Iota, Alpha, and Omega. Well, what was this? This is a weird looking figure. And by the way, the Templars later adopted this symbol and put it on their seal. So this is an old Templar seal that says Templi Secretum. This is an old seal that the Knights Templar used. Well, what this, uh, this seal of Abraxas really represented was it represented stages of identification of consciousness. So the, the, le the serpent legs represented uh, people associated with physical things or associated with the earth itself, uh, just as uh, serpents crawl close to the earth. Um, in the same way, this was the, the first stage of humanity, the Gnostics said. They said that uh, they referred to people who hadn't been initiated yet as profane or uninitiated. And that uh, in order to um, bring people into the Gnostic mysteries, they first had to go through an initiation that involved a baptism by water, after which they were presented with an apron that hung at the area of the abdomen, which is where all the liquid functions of the body take place. Uh, and it was at this stage that the Gnostic had to learn to subdue their passions. And they had to learn to use their emotions as an energy for transformation as opposed to drowning in their emotions. And they, they believed that passages in the Bible that referred to um, Jesus as walking on water as uh, really being about how do you stabilize your emotions so that you can walk on them, so you can use them to accomplish things as opposed to drowning in them? So this this um, this apron at the abdomen on Abraxas represented the first stage of initiation. The second stage of initiation was represented by a whip that cracked in the air, and this is, was associated with things of the mind. And that it was at this stage that the Gnostic began the study of the seven liberal arts and sciences, not just so that they could learn um, great trivia, but so that they could understand that these things were aspects of the mind of the creator. And so by understanding these things, it helped bring the person closer to the mind of the creator itself and then finally the last stage of initiation was associated with a rooster head um, because uh, and it was associated with fire and the rooster head uh, it was represented by a rooster head because a rooster what does it do when it sees the first light of the day it calls out to it and again, the Gnostics referred to themselves as the sons of light. So they were, it, it was a, or the religion of light. 
And so um, this is what the Templars were secretly practicing uh, with these initiations. Uh, so again, when you combine this with the, that Kabbalistic diagram that I showed in which people had to go through the stages of water, air, and fire on the Kabbalistic tree in the same way, on this seal of Abraxas, you had the water, air, and fire levels that the people had to go through. So this concealed the secret doctrine of the Templars, which, by the way, if you haven't figured it out yet, is the same secret uh, initiation rites that we continue to practice today within Freemasonry, which is why it, it matches exactly. Now, some of the other groups that the Templars were associating with and were working with at the time were the Sufi uh, of the Middle East. These are uh, pictures of some whirling dervishes. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, Hugh de Payne's grandfather was a Sufi. Uh, they were mystic Muslims. They wear these, these giant um, fezzes that look like kind of like Shriner fezzes on steroids. <laughs> but but they, uh, what, they, what they represented is these, these hats represented Islamic tombstones because they say they had symbolically died to this world and then been raised to a new light of understanding. Right, that sound that should sound familiar to almost everybody on this call, I would think. Um, they also, uh, you can see them doing what in uh, some uh, branches of Freemasonry is called the sign of the Good Shepherd. This is how they pray, just like how we pray. Uh, you'll find it in the Scottish Rite. That's how they pray as well. Um, these black cloaks, which they wear going into their teques or their temples, represent cloaks of invisibility. And they enter into their temples and they bow to a lamb skin that's placed in the east of the temple that represents the unknown master that they're all becoming. And then they're able to remove the cloak of invisibility. And, uh, and open their teke. And the teke, when they open, they have an officer in the east, in the south, and in the west. They light a candle in the center of the teke. And the three principal officers will, will give signs that represent um, their station. So the first is in the south is called the C sign, which is done like this, putting the, the hand across the throat. It's called the C sign in Sufism. The second is called the saw sign, which is the, the hand across the, the chest. And that's done by the officer that's sitting in the west. And then the master of the teke who sits in the east gives the so sign, which is done with the hand across the abdomen. This is what the, the Sufi have been doing for, well, since the time of the Templars, since the 1200s that we're aware of. And uh, it's quite certain that the Templars, you know, pick up some associations with them. Um, and by the way, the Sufi also have secret forms of recognition. So if you see someone that's a Sufi, you do this. And it represents a point becoming a line. They will then do this, which represents a line becoming a set of compasses. And then you do this, which represents the set of compasses forming a circle. And that's how they'll recognize you as an initiate. Um, that's that's what's done in the Sufi tradition, but it's clear that the Templars were were associating with them. 
And by the way, the reason why this these were called the C, the Sa, and the So sign is the Z part of it represented the active part. And then the I, the A, and the O represented the secret Gnostic name of God. And we find that same I-A-O, if you remember, if we go back on the Templar seal here with the Iota, Alpha, and Omega on the Abraxas seal. It's the same I-A-O. And probably not coincidentally within Freemasonry, within the first two degree passwords, you know, in the first first degree, we have uh, the... the the, the uh, vowels OA in the second degree, we have the vowels AI, you know, being emphasized. So those are being uh, emphasized just like in these earlier traditions. The other group that the Templars were associating with, as per the rule, was the Druze. It's a group known as the Druze, and they live in Lebanon. This is their symbol, this is one of their temples. The five-pointed star represents the five points of their fellowship, and it represents how Gnosis manifests in the world. That looks like the Eastern Star logo. That's because that's where Morris stole it from when he, when he created the uh, Eastern Star ritual. He wrote a book called uh, Journey to the Holy Land, um, and... Uh, I was going to show you, show, I have it back here somewhere, but like, anyhow, where he talks about how he met with the Druze and he met with others, but this is where it came from. It's, it's the, this is where the Eastern Star logo came from. You just turn it and you get the Eastern Star logo. So, but he got it from the Druze and the Druze, again, were associating with the Templars as per the Templars own rule. So who were the Druze? The Druze also referred to themselves as uh, Al Tahid or Al Tahid uh, which just means the oneness of being. So these are the, the Druze. This is a picture of me with one of the Druze sheikhs in Lebanon here on the left. Uh, they wear um, these little mini caps that look like the uh, caps that you would find in the you know, the Scottish right, <laughs> but it's what the Druze wear. That's what they've always worn. Um, this is uh, on the right here. This is uh, Walid Jablat. He's the grand master of the Druze uh, right now in Lebanon. And, um, you know, I met with them. And when the Druze, the Druze have a secret form of recognition with each other. And this form of recognition is done. Normally they do, they use a, you, you do a, you do a special hand grip with them, which by the way, is the exact same hand grip that we, what we call in Freemasonry, the strong grip of a master Mason. Okay. That's what the Druze use as their, their, their hand grip. Only they, they put a sacred clock cloth over it. They do do the same uh, five points that we would recognize within Freemasonry uh, because those five points correspond to the five points of their star. And the Druze at that point will say to each other, Muhabin, Muhabin, which in Arabic means welcome to the loving place or welcome to the place of the heart. It comes from the Arabic word mahaba, which just means to love. So mohabin means welcome to the loving place. And this is how the, the Druze will secretly greet each other. And this is how I was able to meet with them. They have their own initiation rites. They also venerate Pythagoras as a prophet. And they also venerate Hermes as a prophet. In fact, uh, two of the points on their star correspond to, you know, one corresponds to Pythagoras and one corresponds to Hermes. Um, they believe that they were the, the original builders of King Solomon's temple. 
when according to their own myths, they believed that certain souls came to earth in antiquity to Egypt and that uh, they incorporated all of their knowledge into two pillars, one to withstand water and one to withstand fire. And that there was a great flood that came that wiped out civilization and that the Druze were able to find these pillars, uh, relearn the arts and sciences and teach them to mankind. And that this was the secret of their doctrine and that their initiation rites were tied up in this. Sounds very similar to Freemasonry, Freemasonry, but the thing is the Druze have been talking about this since the 1200s, right? So where did Freemasonry get it? Well, the only people that were traveling from between Scotland and the Middle East uh, and were bringing and who were associating with the Druze back in the 1200s were the Knights Templar. So it suggests very, very, very strongly that Freemasonry inherited these things uh, from these groups that the Templars were associating with. Some of the other things that the Templars did is they were responsible for, uh, they had their doctrines of alchemy, but they also um, built uh, the cathedrals of Europe. They're the ones who provided the initial funding and, the, uh, uh, and they incorporated much of their alchemical knowledge that they were learning from the Druze and from the Sufi onto these cathedrals. So like, for example, this is at Chartres Cathedral, this labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral in France. And uh, we know where this diagram came from. It came from this alchemical text <laughs> in which this diagram was known as the Labyrinth of Solomon. And it was from an alchemical manuscript that the Druze were translating, that the Templars brought over from, um, from the Middle East and then incorporated it into Shat Cathedral. Most people don't realize that when, when people think of the Knights Templar, they think of just a bunch of knights running around on horseback, you know, being crusaders or whatever. But actually the, the Templars had, they had clerics, they had sea captains, they had bankers, they had farmers. Uh, they even had stonemasons that were within the Templar order who were responsible for building their commandery buildings and chapels. And they, by some accounts, they built over 1,200 different Gothic structures across Europe between 1118 and 1314. And uh, this is one of the Templar rules. Again, this is from the Templar rule of 1268. This was article number 325 in the Templar rule. It says, no brother should ever swear when angry or calm, nor should he ever say an ugly or vile word, even less do such a thing. I would be guilty of that. <laughs> Uh, then he says, each brother is required to do all noble actions and say all good words. No brothers should wear leather gloves except for the chaplain brothers who are permitted to wear them in honor of our Lord's body, which they often hold in their hands. And they're talking about the, the sacrament here, the, the Christian sacrament. And the Templar Mason brothers may wear them sometimes, but they should not wear them when they're not at work. So here's a from the Templar rule of 1268 talking about this subset within the Templar order that were Templar Masons, whose job was to build things, and they were they were one of the only people permitted to wear leather gloves uh, within the Templar order. Now, normally when people think of the cathedral builders, they, they think of the companions of France. Uh, which were are the standard historical 
people accredit associated with building the cathedrals, but the, the companions themselves, they still exist to this day. And they're divided into two groups. Uh, one is known as the children of Solomon, and the other is known as the children of the master Jack. And according to their own accounts, uh, the children of Solomon got their name from the children of the poor knights of Christ of the Temple of Solomon, which were the Knights Templar. And the children of the master Jacques got their name from the children of Jacques de Molay, who was the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, who was burnt at the stake in 1314. So both branches of the Companions say that they were the original building force of the Knights Templar. So the people credited with building the cathedrals were all the original building force of the Templars. Let me show you just a, a few examples of some cool things in the cathedrals themselves. This is at Schock Cathedral. If you go around Schock Cathedral, you'll find that all the stained glass windows, which by the way, were made alchemically using uh, different metallic salts to produce these colors. Uh, they're all named after different saints around the cathedrals. One of the one of the windows at Shot Cathedral is named after Saint Apollo. Well, there's no Saint Apollo in the Christian tradition. <laughs> Apollo was the sun god. It just so happens on this window that's dedicated to Saint Apollo, there's a little tiny hole. And on the floor below this window, all of the stones are tiled going the same direction except for one, which is diagonal. And on this one uh, stone floor slab that's going the wrong direction has a little um, brass peg in it and on saint john the baptist day a ray of light comes in this hole in the stained glass window and it hits this bronze peg on the floor and between the the wall that the window's on the beam of light and then the floor itself, that ends up forming a perfect three, four, five triangle of Pythagoras. So here again, we have this, this, uh, this knowledge being preserved and the secret knowledge being preserved in the cathedral. Uh, it's done, it, that takes place on St. John the Baptist Day, which is June 23rd. And it, um, you know, ends up forming this three, four, five triangle. So these are just some of the things that were incorporated in the cathedral. There's also like uh, in the crypt of the cathedral, there's a starry deck canopy on the ceiling uh, with the sun and the moon. And then there's a hand which represents the hand of the masteries, or the hand of the mysteries, and it represents the hand of the master. So we have depicted the sun, moon, and master on the starry deck canopy in the crypt of Shot Cathedral, which again, is again, something we find in Freemasonry. We also find things, this is me holding some door handles. You can see there's a, on the door handles is a, here's a close up. You see it's an eye and a triangle within a squared circle. And this is really the, the origin of the, you know, the, the square and compasses symbol comes from the square, which can be used to, to literally form squares, which represented material world in, the, in ancient geometry. And the circle, which is, which is done, made by the compasses, uh, and it represented spiritual reality. It had no beginning and no end. That's where the circle became significant. And then there's the triangle that unites the two. And of course, then there's this eye in the triangle. So this is, this is on a temple that the Templars were using all the way up into the 1600s uh, in Germany. And um, 
you know, it continues to exist to this day. In fact, here's the crypt. Here's the Templar crypt there. <laughs> you can see the Templar crosses on the wall, and you can see that this is all the Templar knights that are buried there. You know, going from the 1200s all the way up into the 1600s. So there's a Templar tradition surviving in Germany, just as there was in Portugal, just as there was in Scotland. That's the ceiling of the crypt. And notice it's a red Templar cross with a rose in the center, surrounded by roses, forming a rose crosses. And then again, the starry decked canopy. Pretty interesting, you know, all symbols that we find in Freemasonry today. But again, these, you know, date back before Freemasonry is supposedly established. One of the one of the things we also find in the Grail legends, which is significant to Freemasonry, in, in Wolfgang von Eschenbach's Percival, after Percival finds the Holy Grail, he ends up um, marrying uh, this Grail maiden who's known as Repance de Choi, which just means the chosen response. Um, they end up running off to India and they give birth to a son by the name of John. And uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach's Percival says they called him Prester John. And ever since, they call all their kings by no other name. So after they give birth to John, they, all the kings form a successive length of holy saints John within this grail tradition. And in fact, even to this day, uh, within Gnostic groups, uh, tr church traditions like the Yoanite Gnostic Church, uh, they, their leaders continue to assume the name of John. And they ascribe to themselves their foundation with the uh, Templar order. So these things continue to exist to this day. Now, we can't finish this up without at least talking about briefly about um, Rosalind Chapel. Um, certainly, Dan Brown mentioned Rosalind Chapel and associated with the Templars. There's been some Masonic scholars that have said, oh, there's no evidence connecting the Templars to Rosalind Chapel or connecting Rosalind Chapel to Freemasonry. But I'm just going to point out a few things that those scholars haven't necessarily noticed. Uh, there's a couple, there's some pillars and there's some front um, scenes in the, the chapel. Uh, and this is in Scotland, by the way, where we find Templars being depicted. Uh, first of all, here's, here's one where you see the knight on a horse. There's actually two knights on this horse. And you can see on this knight has the Templar cross on his chest, and they're both riding this horse. So that's the Templar seal. And then over here, we see uh, there's a Templar knight. He has the Templar cross on his, it's a little hard to see, but on his chest. And he's holding a cable toe that's going around the neck of this other Templar who's blindfolded. So he's blindfolded with a cable toe around his neck and he's leading him between two pillars. Well, Rosalind Chapel was completed in 1420. So um, that's pretty, you know, it's pretty suggestive that the Templars were practicing certain initiation rites which are similar to what we find in Freemasonry today and seem to tie into these same mystical doctrines which we talked about before. One of the other things that we find at Roslyn Chapel is that there's these angels that are playing instruments and above the angels' heads are these boxes. And in the boxes are these strange geometric designs and forever 
historians have wondered what these are. If we look closely at the angels and the instruments they're playing, we can see which notes that they're playing on the instruments, right? And then we see the geometric shape above their head. What we now know what these are is actually, and here's some more of them, what they actually are is what's known as semantic music designs, which is if you take like a drum or a, um, you know, some form of a, yeah, like a drum with a stretch canvas over the top of it and you sprinkle sand on it and you play a musical note through that drum, it'll cause the sand on top of the, the drum to organize itself according to geometric patterns. This was something that was supposedly discovered. And so this is a modern example of that. Here's another modern example of this. But this is something that was supposedly discovered in the 1800s, yet, we find um, it being in, uh, encoded at Rosalind Chapel from the 1400s. Uh, the Rosalind Chapel was built by the Sinclair family. By the way, the same Sinclair family that Hugh de Paines married into, Catherine de Sinclair was his wife. Uh, this is the same family. Um, who, who founded the, the Templar order. Um, so uh, it suggests that the Templars already understood this science and incorporated it onto that building. And uh, should we doubt that there really was a Templar connection between Roslyn Chapel and the early Knights Templar? We need nearly merely to go to their their um, their former commandery in Istanbul, which was Constantinople at the time, and we find that on the ledges, the top ceiling ledges of that commandery building, we find the same semantic music designs that we find at Rosalind Chapel. Here's other examples of it. Well, that would be one amazing coincidence <laughs> if, you know, the only two buildings in the ancient world that had somatic music designs carved into them just happened to both be occupied by the Knights Templar. It seems to suggest it was a secret doctrine being passed on by the Templars. And it also seems to be proof that Yes, the Templars were involved in the creation of Rosalind Chapel. It's the only way those things could show up on Rosalind Chapel and show up at the former Templar commandery in Istanbul or Constantinople at the time. And by the way, um, the other thing that we also find at Rosalind Chapel and at the former Templar commandery in Istanbul is I mentioned before the former Templar commander in Istanbul was built like a giant beehive. And in fact, this is the reason why the prayer turret had the honeycomb shapes on it, because the floor tiles, which you can't see here because they're underneath the carpet, but the floor tiles from this building are all honeycomb shaped as well. So the Templars built this building as a giant beehive and at Rosalind Chapel in in Scotland on the roof of Rosalind Chapel we find the earliest example of a working beehive that was incorporated into the architecture of the the chapel itself so we have this beehive being connected by with both and by the way also um St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote the rule for the temple, Templars, his personal emblem, his personal watermark, if you will, his personal seal was also the beehive. So this is just, again, one more connection 
uh, connecting the Templars and connecting to Freemasonry. Finally, this is the on the top here. This is the the former Templar commandery in Istanbul, uh, where Hugh de Paynes and Godfrey de Saint Omar were initiated when they formed the Templar Order. Down here on the lower right, this is Templar Church in London, and it was built to look like and to mimic the same architecture of the Templar Commandery in Constantinople. It's just a, it's like a smaller version of the one that's in Constantinople, but that's where they got the architecture from. So not only was there the beehive stuff, not only was there the square and compasses in it, not only was there the crypt in it that had Templars of all different religious backgrounds uh, being buried together, uh, but the very architecture of the thing itself ended up forming the basis for Templar Church in London. So there we have it. So what we what do we have here? It, 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 we have a whole lot of um, things pointing to this idea that the Knights Templar inherited these mystical philosophies from these different groups around the Middle East and from their digging in Jerusalem. They brought these things back to Europe. This is largely what created the Renaissance um, in, uh, in Europe. And, um, and that as a result, the, the the secret doctrines that the that the Templars had inherited were included into the Grail legends, the legends of the Holy Grail, which were published by Wolfram von Eschenbach at the same time. And it just so happens that these exact same philosophies also found their way later on into the rituals and degree work of Freemasonry. And I mean, that's, that's one hell of a coincidence if they're not connected, right? So it seems to suggest that yes, Freemasonry is the inheritor of this grail tradition of which the Templars were the, the guardians of. Um, and now it's, uh, it's inherited by Freemasonry and you are the you're the guardians of this philosophy. And every time you're doing initiation work, every time you're doing degree work, you're passing on these same fundamental ideas that were being preserved by all these groups that the Templars came in contact with and which were fundamental to the grail legends themselves. So um, that's all I got. <laughs> as far as this presentation goes. I mean, we could go on for hours and hours more and I could show you a whole lot more, but for the sake of time, I think that's a good, uh, a good summary of what you've inherited um, as, as uh, Freemasons in our tradition. So, uh, anybody have any questions? <laughs> Well, first, first, before we get to that, Brother Tim, I have to thank you so much for this very deeply researched and, in my way, thought masterfully presented amount of material in, in this short amount of time that, that you had uh, in this talk. Indeed, a fascinating presentation. I think we all would have to agree with that. So, and for everyone else around me here and all of us together, we thank you deeply for this really fascinating information. Thank you. And yes, um, I believe we uh, do have some questions if you still have a little time for us. Uh, I do. For that. Uh, brethren, I will again call your attention to the bottom of your screen. If you wish to direct a question to our speaker, you can either click on the chat box and submit it or you can click on the raised hand feature and ask your question directly. Rest assured, rest assured that if your question does not get answered tonight, they will be saved and forwarded to our presenter, uh, Worshipful Brother Tim. 
Now, brothers Chris and Gary, and uh, some questions for brother Tim. Okay, so our first question is um, from Dr. Patrick Bailey from Burlingame Lodge 400. I am very interested in making the Philosopher's Stone, mm -hmm. the molten, molten antimony at gold kicks, and then by using acid and base over and over to swing the pH and form monoatomic gold in the mixture. Have you ever, are you doing this? And who can I contact to proceed in doing this? Um, yes, well, that is that is definitely one of the secrets to uh, alchemy. I mean, it's uh, so monoatomic gold uh, can be extracted out of a number of different things. It's it's found in um, gold itself, but you can also find it in sea salts and in a number of things. Um, this monoatomic gold was one of the main, believed to be one of the main ingredients to the Philosopher's Stone itself. And um, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a lab and I, I, I extract it all the time. And by the way, uh, it's also believed that um, in the Torah, when Solomon was said to have received 666 talents of gold a year in exchange for bread, that this was what it was really alluding to was this idea of, first of all, that number 666 had, it had nothing to do with the devil. In the ancient world, that was the number of transformation or transmutation. So in the story, he receives 666 talents of gold in the exchanges them for bread, which seems to suggest the, the, the secret message there is he was taking gold and he was transmuting it into this bread, which uh, in uh, the biblical language would be known as shrew bread or mana itself. So mana was associated with this. Uh, anytime you see mana in the Bible, it was really alluding to this monoatomic gold. And by the way, the the Albigensian Cathars, who the original Templars all came out of, they had a ceremony that they performed uh, each year that was kind of like a communion rite, and it was known as the Mani Sola ceremony. And it was basically a communion using this monoatomic gold. So they were passing on this, this knowledge. Um, the Druze were also passing it on as were the Sufi and they were all, they were all studying these alchemical things, which we also find in, in Freemasonry. So hopefully that kind of is a general summary of it. <laughs> so what's the next question? Uh, well, we have the next question coming from Brother Irving Sambolin. Have you come across the translation of the journals of Prince Henry Sinclair, 1353 to 1395, corroborating the connection between the Templars, Rosalind, the Sinclairs, and Freemasonry, as well as evidence of the Templar voyages to the Americas? I, um, I have, yeah. I've, I've studied uh, all of these journals. Um, they're published by Diane Muir is her name, M-U-I-R, who's, a, who's a, also a, a very established genealogist, just as a side. Um, but they, um, uh, these journals uh, do discuss uh, Prince Henry Sinclair's, you know, trips to the Americas in which he brought artifacts from Jerusalem over to the Americas to be deposited in secret vaults. And uh, it's there are several things in these that seem to suggest a um, an early connection between the Templars and what was to become Freemasonry. Um, there's many it's more, um, it's not like, it's not like, oh, the Templars gave the charter to the Freemasons and passed it on. It's not, not really like that. It's just like um, there was already, 
things in place within the Templar order that uh, we also find within Freemasonry now, and again, seems to suggest Freemasonry just inherited some of this. Uh, if you're interested in this, I would um, really point out, uh, I would really recommend um, Scott Walter's book. Um, let me grab it here. Hang on. Uh, he has a book called uh, Cryptic Code of the Templars in America by Scott Walter. Uh, and he explores some of this as well as some other documents um, related to these early Templar voyages to the Americas. Um, and then um, Diane Meir also has a book out published that I, I don't see it right now, but it but it's it is the same, just as it says, it's the actual journal entries of uh, Prince Henry Sinclair um, in his journeys to the Americas. So, um, carrying Templar treasure. So, yep. Okay, the next question is from Dr. Philip Doyle. Thanks for much, so much for this opportunity. I study harmonics and ratios in a system called the Lambdoma, which is held to have its roots, it, roots in the teachings of Pythagoras. Semantics, as an example, form only at certain frequencies, otherwise are indiscernible. That suggests a quantum or stages of a higher order. Can you, can you suggest any texts or sources that expand on the effects of frequency on consciousness, Masonic or otherwise? Ooh, that's a that's a really that's a deep question. Um, well, I, I will say that the um, it's it's believed that many of the early chapels and temples uh, that we find with within the the cathedrals, like some of the crypts in the cathedrals, they were built with these harmonic ideas in mind. Uh, and you also find this within some of the Egyptian and Greek temples uh, where there was almost like um, the, the temple itself would be made to really resonate at a particular frequency. So when people would go in there and they would, would sing or they would, um, you know, sing cer certain notes with their voice it would really cause that that chamber to resonate and uh, which had an effect on consciousness and, you know it was believed to have an effect on consciousness so um isaac newton was one of the people who was studying the proportions of uh, height of the cathedrals in relation to different certain notes and how that caused a resonance in the consciousness. And um, it was believed that many of the early church songs were, uh, were doing this as well. And by the way, the ratio proportions of these cathedrals also corresponded to uh, ratio proportions of um, what we now call uh, Boyd's law of the distance of the planets from each other and uh, how um, uh, distance between the earth and the moon and uh, other things of this nature that, that seem to have. So they took the, these, these proportions in the universal order that they found in the solar system and they incorporated them into the building itself. And it was believed that by causing this resonance frequency, they were, they were actually also resonating with a more universal order, which uh, Pythagoras of course called the music of the spheres. It does suggest that there's these states of resonance in which uh, magic happens, you know. I don't know if that answers it, but <laughs> that's a pretty deep, deep subject. But um, 
and there's evidence of that. Well, Worshipful, we have another question coming in here from Brother Robert White. Is it a coincidence that the Templar headquarters in Constantinople resembles the Hagia Sophia built around 360 AD? Yes, yeah, so, the, so the Templar commandery in Istanbul was actually built. So when it was originally built as a church, it was built prior to the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. So uh, it was, it's now referred to as the little Hagia Sophia. Like if you wanted to go visit it in Istanbul today, it's referred to as the little Hagia Sophia mosque because it looks similar to the, the giant Hagia Sophia itself, but it's because it was originally built as a, as a church kind of near the Hagia Sophia. Uh, and then once they built it, the, it was, and it was actually built by an alchemist, a um, guy by the name of uh, An Anaxagoras, I think was his name. He also wrote books on uh, burning mirrors and other weird stuff. But he um, he's the one who, who originally set up the, uh, the architecture for the little Hagia Sophia. And then from it, which was called the, the, the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus at the time. And then from that, they built the Hagia Sophia, the giant Hagia Sophia, based off of that smaller church model. And then it was only later that the Knights Templar then uh, went in and occupied that smaller church and then started adding things onto it, like the like the square and compasses and the onk and the beehive motifs and some of that other stuff. I mean, the, as they were occupying that particular building. So yeah, there is a, there is a, there is definitely a direct correlation between the little Hagia Sophia, the former Templar commandery and the larger big Hagia Sophia that people think of. Okay. And they're nearby each other too. They're like, within walking distance of each other, like maybe, you know, 15 minutes walk from each other. <laughs> okay, the next question is, was the Templar culture a free enterprise society? Labor itself is an individual's property, the, his capital which produces his wealth. Um, it's complicated. So when you joined the Templar order, you gave up everything all your wealth and everything to the Templar order. But then the Templar order took care of you from that moment forward. And anything that you did on behalf of the Templar order went back into the community. So in a sense, uh, many people describe the Templar order as the first multinational corporation because they were doing you know, they were building things, they were farming, they were sailing, they set up banking and everything else all throughout Europe. Uh, it used to be, for example, if you were a, let's say you were a prince in Scotland and you were planning on going to the Holy Land and you didn't want to get robbed on your way to the Holy Land, what you would do is you would deposit money at the Templar commandery in Scotland and they would give you certain memory devices and certain handshakes and certain back and forth dialogue to memorize, just much like what we do with our memory work within Freemasonry. And if you had the right answers memorized, then what you would do then is you could travel down to Jerusalem and then you could go to the Templar commandery in Jerusalem you could do this exchange with them with the giving the grips and, and, and doing the memory work. And then they would know, Oh, okay. You're, you're legit. And here's your money. You know, you deposited, you know, $500 in the, the commandery in uh, Scotland. Uh, well, we'll give you, you know, 490 of it back. 
here in Jerusalem and we'll keep $10 for ourselves, you know, it's like, you know, a fee for, for the service of holding it. For How they're getting rich and they set up a banking service. I mean, that's what we do back into the order. So it was, um, they set up banking and business that transcended borders and the Templars didn't have to answer to anybody but the Pope. So that was the only person they had to answer to. So they were able to do what they wanted. To do what they, wanted. they were free in that sense. Instead of making money for yourself as an individual, if you were making money, it went back into the order itself. So it was all communal within the order. So, but they, they gained so much money that they, um, through their endeavors that, uh, you know, it was said they had great reserves and this was part of the reason that they fall because uh, King Philip the Fair of France, Philip the Fourth, he uh, he wanted to stage wars in Europe. He was trying to set himself up as a war king. He needed money to do that, and and he didn't have the money in France to to do the wars that he wanted. He knew the Templars had a bunch of money stored in their commanderies, and so that was part of the reason why he devised the plot to. Uh, to ultimately um, suppress the Templar order to try to steal their wealth. And um, he, he wasn't successful because the Templars actually, uh, the, the orders for the arrest of the Templars was issued almost a month before the actual arrest date. And the Templars got tipped off as to what was going to happen so they cleared all their money and everything out of their commandery before they were arrested so when the arrest orders came you know there was nothing there and uh, you know uh, Philip was kind of in, in bad shape you know <laughs> so that's part of the reason why the Templars are tortured too because they were trying to find out where all the money and all the treasures and everything went, but nobody would, would give up the secret. So. Any other questions? Well, Tim, I, I think probably if there are some, you will receive them uh, forthwith however as we promised to those who did not get their questions answered and maybe you would have uh, enough time to to deal with that in your own way in another time to correspond in some way with that thank you again uh worshipful tim uh for agreeing to be with us uh, this evening and presenting your focus on the holy grail and how it squares pun intended how it squares with the Brotherhood of Masonry. Before we do retire this evening, I would like to give special thanks uh, for all the help and support from our back end team, which made this evening's presentation possible. Again, Worshipful Master Roberto Diaz Jr., Worshipful Brother Marty Cousing, Past Master, Worshipful Brother Gary Stevens, Past Master and brothers Aidan Cotter, chaplain, and Chris Advencula, Jr. Once again, uh, thank you gentlemen for a job well done. And brethren all, thank you for being with us tonight. And we look forward to having you join us again for our future speakers. As a reminder, tonight's presentation was recorded and will be made available to everyone who registered. The link will be emailed to you. And please feel free to share this with, uh, with others. The recording can also be accessed on Burlingame Lodge's Facebook page. Regarding future presentations, just take a quick moment for that. Next month, May 18th, again at 7 p.m., 
we have our California Grand Secretary, Worshipful Brother Alan Casalou. His topic is Brother Earl Warren, past governor of California and chief justice of the United States Supreme Court, speaking about uh, Justice Warren's principles involving in, in, free, in Freemasonry. A flyer with instructions on how to register will be forthcoming as always and sent to all those who registered uh, for any of our presentations in the past. Now in closing, I'll call upon Brother Aidan Cotter, our chaplain, who will lead us in the benediction. Brother Chaplain. Thank you, brothers. Supreme Grand Master, ruler of heaven and earth, now that we are about to separate and return to our respective places of abode, wilt thou be pleased so to influence our hearts and minds that we may each one of us practice out of the lodge the great moral duties which are inculcated in it, and with reverence study and obey the laws which thou hast given us in thy holy word. Amen. So mote it be. So mote it be. Uh, good night, brothers. Stay safe.